reading out of the book of Jonah this morning. Jonah chapter 1. We're going to read all of chapter 1 and a little portion of chapter 2. Jonah chapter 1, starting in verse 1. It says, Now the word of the Lord came unto Jonah, the son of Amittai, saying, Arise, go to Nineveh, that great city, and cry against it, for their wickedness has come up before me. But Jonah rose up to flee unto Tarshish from the presence of the Lord, and went down to Joppa, and he found a ship going to Tarshish. So he paid the fare thereof and went down into it to go with them unto Tarshish from the presence of the Lord. But the Lord sent out a great wind into the sea, and there was a mighty tempest in the sea, so that the ship was like to be broken. Then the mariners were afraid, and cried every man unto his God, and cast forth the waves that were in the ship, I'm sorry, the wares that were in the ship, into the sea to lighten it of them. But Jonah was gone down into the sides of the ship, and he lay and was fast asleep. So the shipmaster came to him and said unto him, What meanest thou, O sleeper? Arise, call upon thy God. If so be that God will think upon us, that we perish not. And they said every one to his fellow, Come and let us cast lots, that we may know for whose cause this evil is upon us. So they cast lots, and the lot fell upon Jonah. Then said they unto him, Tell us, we pray thee, for whose cause this evil is upon us? What is thine occupation? And whence comest thou? What is thy country? And of what people art thou? And he said unto them, I am a Hebrew, and I fear the Lord, the God of heaven, which has made the sea and the dry land. Then were the men exceedingly afraid and said unto him, Why hast thou done this? For the men knew that he fled from the presence of the Lord, because he had told them, then said they unto him, What shall we do unto thee, and the sea, that the sea may be calm unto us? For the sea wrought and was tempestuous. And he said unto them, Take me up and cast me forth into the sea, so shall the sea be calm unto you. For I know that for my sake this great tempest is upon you. Nevertheless, the men rode hard to bring it to the land, but they could not, for the sea wrought and was tempestuous against them. Wherefore they cried unto the Lord and said, We beseech thee, O Lord, we beseech thee, let us not perish for this man's life, and lay not upon us innocent blood, for thou, O Lord, hast done as it pleased thee. So they took up Jonah and cast him forth into the sea, and the sea ceased from her raging. Then the men feared the Lord exceedingly, and offered a sacrifice unto the Lord, and made vows. Now the Lord had prepared a great fish to swallow up Jonah, and Jonah was in the belly of the fish three days and three nights. Then Jonah prayed unto the Lord his God out of the fish's belly and said, I cried by reason of mine affliction unto the Lord, and he heard me. Out of the belly of hell cried I, and thou heardest my voice. For thou hast cast me into the deep in the midst of the seas, and the floods compassed about. All thy billows and thy waves passed over me. Then I said, I am cast out of thy sight, yet I will look again toward thy holy temple. The waters compassed me about, even to the soul. The depth closed me round about. The weeds were wrapped around my head. I went down to the bottoms of the mountains. The earth with her bars was about me forever. Yet hast thou brought up my life from corruption, O Lord my God. When my soul fainted within me, I remembered the Lord. And my prayer came in unto thee, into thy holy temple. They that observe lying vanities forsake their own mercy. But I will sacrifice unto thee with the thanksgiving. I will pay that that I have vowed. Salvation is of the Lord. Father, we just thank you and praise you and give you glory and honor, Lord, for the opportunity to speak forth your truth. We pray, Lord God, once again, that you would anoint your word, Lord, that it would go forth this morning and that you would accomplish what you desire to accomplish through it. In Jesus name we pray. Amen. Amen. I titled this morning's message, where there's a will, 
there's a wrong way. Amen? Where there's a will, there's a wrong way. You know, there, there are multitudes of people that look as, at Christians as weak. I, I've said this before, but I'll never forget. I guess I was about, I don't know, maybe 17, 18 years old. But I, I kind of was familiar with Ted Turner. And I kind of liked him because one summer I spent a summer with my, uh, with my uncle, my mom's brother. I spent a summer with them, and, and they lived in Mobile, Alabama, and TBS was kind of just getting started uh, back in the day, that television station and Turner Broadcasting System, and, and, and he owned the Atlanta Braves, and, and like I was just kind of like interested, I guess, because they were talking a lot about him in that area, and, uh, and the fact that he was this kind of self-made man, you know, this ended up being this multi-billionaire or whatever, but later on in life, after my sister had gotten saved and it talked about the Lord and it talked about Christianity, I heard him make this comment about the fact that Christians are weak. Like he looked at, and it come to find out he had been raised and exposed to Christianity, but some things had happened in his life and he had become very bitter and he viewed Christianity as weakness, you know. And I can remember this one preacher actually talking about Ted Turner making that comment and the preacher said, yeah, crippled folk are weak and that he was he was talking about the fact that Christians used their religion as a crutch and the preacher said yeah Christians are weak and, and, and a crippled man needs a crutch the truth of the matter is is that many times people want to deny the fact that this earth according to what the Bible says is fallen and the things that we experience and the pain that we experience is because of the fact that that mankind has fallen into the trap of sin and that sin is rampant upon the earth. But the, the good news is this, is that even though sin is rampant upon the earth and even though evil and sin has touched each and every human being, God wants us to be able to find the truth within all of that pain, within all of that anguish, that he is real, that he has a plan, and ultimately his will and his plan is for us to bow the knee, if you will, and to surrender to God's will. There's a great strength that is found in God, amen, whenever we allow our will to submit and surrender amen. to the will of God. Whenever I, you know, so, so that's really a main part of what I'm desiring to talk about this morning. You know, but unbelievers, oftentimes they view Christianity as this weakness Many times there's this perverted sense of mindset, kind of like the way, I guess you could say that I was raised. I mean, the way that my dad's mindset was. It kept coming up in a time frame, whenever, you know, they used to make comments like this, that, that it, it was a time in the oil field that men, the men were made of iron and the rigs were made of wood. You get the idea that I'm trying to talk about, like this special kind of toughness that, you know, would never quit, would never give up. Uh, that's all good. But in reality, I mean, if I was going to be honest about my dad and his life, he really, yeah, he was tough. Don't get me wrong. But his form of toughness didn't accomplish anything. And as a matter of fact, he might not have surrendered. To, maybe he surrendered to the Lord in the very end. But during his life, he, he didn't surrender to God. No, but he surrendered to other things. <laughs> he surrendered to a bottle. He, he looked to other things to try to escape that, that he might have viewed that as some kind of strength of trying to get himself through something. But there wasn't strength in that. No, instead, it was really a form of weakness that just kind of drove him further and further down. And many times in the world, that's what people are doing. They're looking for other things in order to solace their pain, in order to 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 cause them to to feel, you know, to to lack or to quit feeling the pain that they've been feeling. So many times unbelievers, they just refuse to bow their knee when they face this internal struggle and all of their lives, they never give in. <clears throat> but even in the life of believers, when they struggle in seasons and times of their lives, many times they want to refuse to bend to the will of God. There was a movie that I recently saw and I don't know, I, I recommend the movie. I thought it was really good. It was called Unbroken, The Path to redemption. I think that there was another version of the movie that wasn't as didn't really show the Christian aspect of it, but but this last one it definitely showed the Christian aspect of it. And in the movie, it was a the story was about a guy who had won some Olympic medals, and then when World War II came, he was a he was a I believe he was a pilot, but anyway, he crashed in the Pacific Ocean and he was taken as a prisoner of war. And in the and in the movie. 
it showed how there was this one particular Japanese officer in this constant in this prison camp that just just beat him, beat him senseless and just like in terror, just terrorized him, terrorized him mentally, you know, the, the horrible things that they would do to people. And so <clears throat> he ends up getting out of this prison and he ends up being reunited with his family and he starts to try to get his life back. He starts to try to go back to training to maybe run back in the Olympics and things like that. He actually meets the girl of his dreams. He gets married to her. They end up having children, but he's never able to shake this past experience that had plagued his life and, and the torment and the pain that he was experiencing from all of that. And uh, he would have these flashbacks where this Japanese officer was in his face and he would remember these various things that would take place. And he ends up turning towards alcohol uh, to try to numb the pain and to try to, to make it go away. And ultimately, that just causes things to worsen in his life. And he begins to spiral downward. And the more that he tries <clears throat> to fix it his own way, the worse things get and it's really causing destruction in his home causes destruction in his in his family and he gets to the point where he doesn't really know what to do because you know to be truthful he loves his wife he loves his family but he can't really stop he, he doesn't know how to make it stop and his wife gets to the point where as much as she loves him she just she ends up deciding that she's going to have to leave well this i think it was a uh I don't know if it was a maid or some person maybe she worked with, some lady invited her to a Billy Graham revival. And she went, and this is all based on a true story. This really happened. And she went to the revival and like God really ministered to her heart. And she went back on a couple of occasions and she tried to talk to the husband, tried to invite him. He was really just resistant. His heart was hard towards towards hearing any of that. He viewed it, the classic example of what I'm trying to talk about. He viewed it as a sign of weakness and, and he just viewed her as weak and he was just refusing, even though everything was falling down around him, every, even though everything was being destroyed right in front of his very eyes, he refused to bow the knee to this situation. But then he, he ends up gravitating towards that. You know how the Holy Spirit will do somehow. He doesn't even know how he ends up over there and he ends up in this service. And I'm telling you, the message was tailor made for him. Uh, it talked about, you know, the, the, the storm and the waves. And he remembered when he was in, in that boat because he, he had been in this boat after the plane crash for multiple days, you know, before he was found by that Japanese ship and, and, he, and, and, and all of these things happening in the midst of this message that God had spoken for him. But yet at the same time, he stiffened his neck and he tried to walk out and he, he was leaving the tent. And, and, you know, the way Hollywood would do it, I don't know if this is actually how it happened, but that Japanese officer's face came back in his face and really playing the role of Satan began to tell him, you'll never be able to get away from me. You'll never be able to get away from me. You'll never be able to be free. And, you know, in that moment in time, that man just came. He turned around and instead of walking out of that tent, he walked to the middle of the aisle and he fell down on his knees and he surrendered his heart to the Lord and he gave his life to Jesus Christ. And really, the, the story goes on to say that he that he worked with young people for the rest of his life. They showed him at the end of the movie. He was like in his 80s. He had started this program for kids that were troubled and helped them and led them to Christ. And uh, it was really a, a very touching story. But, you know, the whole reason I talked about that was because I was trying to talk about the will of man. Because where there's a will, that's the title of this morning's message, there's a wrong way. And as long as man's will stands in the way, it prevents us from going towards uh, the will of God. And that was point number one uh, of my message this morning. The direction away from God leads down. In, jo in Jonah chapter 1 verse 3, if we go back to the text, God had told Jonah that he wanted him to go to Nineveh because he wanted him to preach God, the, his word, his truth to the Ninevites because he desired for them to have an opportunity to hear the gospel and to repent. But Jonah rose up to flee unto Tarshish from the presence of the Lord and went down to Joppa and he found a ship going to Tarshish so that he paid the fare thereof and went down into it to go with them unto Tarshish from the presence of the Lord. 
God's will for Jonah's life was that he would go to Nineveh to preach the truth, like I said. And it's always God's will for people to hear the truth. Amen. It's always God's will for people to hear the truth of the gospel so that they can have the opportunity to respond. And so in each and every one of our lives, we may not like to hear this, but God's will for the believer is that we would, in a sense, be a preacher. I'm not trying to say that everybody's going to have the same personality, that everybody's got to stand on a street corner with a megaphone. That's not what I'm trying to say. What I'm trying to say is that in each and every one of our lives, if we're truly living for the Lord, God desires for the gospel in us to reach out to others around us so that others will be able to hear that there's the hope of a God. A hope of a God in heaven that can that can give them the hope that their heart's looking for. Amen. But really, the main emphasis of what I'm trying to talk about right here is this, is the fact that whenever God tells you to go towards Nineveh, because I mean, I could write you, I could draw you a, a, a picture on the board real quick that whenever God tells you to go towards Nineveh, see, this is Israel right here. The Sea of Galilee, the Dead Sea, the Tigris and the Euphrates, Nineveh's up here. Tarshish is way over here. And the idea is that whenever God tells you to go towards Nineveh and you instead go the opposite direction, basically you're just moving and running away from the will of God for your life. How many times is God moving upon people's hearts by the power of his Holy Spirit, desiring to draw them in a particular direction, but yet God's people run from the will, run from the direction that God would have them to go, the direction away from God, I got to have to tell you, it leads downward. And when people run in the opposite direction, two things will happen. Real quick, you can't really run away or get away from God, but no matter because no matter how far you go, he will be there. But when we rebel, one the first thing real quick is that Jonah moved away from God's presence in two different times in that passage of verse two. It said that the direction that God Jonah was going was in away from it was fleeing from the presence of God. And, he, and I want you to know this morning that closeness to God's presence is connected to God's will for our lives. Amen. The further we move away from the will of God for our lives, the further we will be moving away from the presence of God for our lives. Amen. Many times we question in our own hearts and, and in our mind, we say, well, I don't feel God. I don't hear God anymore. I don't feel God's presence. He seems to be so far away from me. That's been God never moved. God's in the same place where we left him. God never moves. He's never changing. He's the same yesterday, today, and forever. And he has a will for our lives. But yet our own will, where there's a will, there's a wrong way. Our own will brings us towards Tarshish, which is in the opposite direction of God's will for our life. And when we do that, we move further away from the presence of God. There's danger in moving away from the presence of God. Amen. There's danger that you won't be able to hear the voice of the Lord clearly anymore. There's danger that you won't be able to see his will for your life. Any more the way that you were able to in the beginning. Not only will you move away from the presence of God when you move away from the will of God. But the second thing is this. Jonah went down. The direction away from the presence of God is downward. It's true that he moved downward. And I'm talking physically. He moved south towards Joppa to get the ticket to go to Tarshish. He moved down into the into the ship. Ultimately, whenever they find him, he's moved down even further into the ship, into the sides of the ship where he had fallen asleep. And so so he's moving in a physical way downward. But what I want you to know is this, is that whenever we move in the opposite direction of God's will for our lives, there's a downward slide that takes place in the life of the believer. Whenever you run from the presence of the Lord, there's no question. You're not going to move up with wings of eagles to soar. Instead, you're going to fall downward and you're going to continue to slide downward away from the presence and the will of God. Look at Matthew chapter 7 verses 26 through 27. Jesus spoke of this. He's speaking about the word of God. He's speaking about the counsel of God. How it desires, how the word of God wants to give direction to the life of the believer. And he's talking about his words and his sayings. He says, everyone that hears these sayings of mine and does them not will be likened unto a foolish man which built his house upon the sand and the rain descended and the floods came and the winds blew 
and beat upon that house and it fell and great was the fall of it. Each and every one of us as the children of God have the opportunity to hear the word of God. But at the same time, we have to make a, de a, a decision in our hearts and lives according to our will versus God's will on whether or not we're really going to believe the word of God. Whether or not we're going to allow the word of God to give counsel to us and to give direction to us. And Jesus likens it to the fact that whenever we hear the word and we refuse to submit to the word... That it's like a man that builds his house on the foundation of sand. Now, I don't know about you, but I've been to the beach on enough occasions to know that when you stand in the surf on the sand and it, that water gets up on top of your feet and when it goes back out to the ocean, what does it do? It pulls the sand out from underneath your feet. And it's the same thing. That's the kind of foundation that people who refuse to build their life on the word of God, they're building their lives upon the sand. And now I can tell you that just, just, just for those out there that may think in your mind, yeah, but I know some people who, who didn't give their heart to God. I know some people who never once lived for the Lord. They were successful. Their, their family looked like they had things going in the right direction. They lived in nice houses. They had crown molding. They drove, they drove nice cars. But when it's all said and done, that house will not stand. It's, it, we may have to wait until we get to eternity for this word to be proven, but that's exactly what's going to happen. When it's all said and done, that house will not stand. That house will have been built on the sand and it will fall and great will be the fall of that house. The storms of life brought down that man's house and that transitions to the next point because we're talking about Jonah. We're talking about the fact that he went in an opposite direction. We're talking about the fact that, that not only did that direction bring him away from the presence of God, but it also brought him down. But this storm, the storms of life brought this house down. And look, God sent the storm in Jonah's life. That's point number two. I wanted you to see it. God's the one that sent the storm. Jonah chapter one, verse four. But the Lord <clears throat> sent out a great wind into the sea and there was a mighty tempest in the sea so that the ship was like to be broken. You know, God loves us so much that he desires a relationship. He wants to have a relationship with us so much. He won't just quit on us. I don't know about if you've ever experienced times in your life where other people may have quit on you. You know, there's been times in my life. I can tell you that there were times in my life, definitely as like a young teenager or a young adult, when things really got bad in my life, when, when things were very chaotic in my life when everything around me was a drama fest, that people, to be honest with you, I can start to tell they didn't really want to be around me. You know what I'm saying? I mean, it's, it's a hard thing for you, for you to admit to yourself, but the truth be told, and still even today I can tell sometimes people don't want to be around me. But you know, one of the things I'll tell you is this, is that God will never quit on you. Amen. Amen. God will never quit on you and he always wants to be around you. But sometimes he has to allow storms in our lives because when we're running away and God's not going to quit if we refuse to submit to his will get prepared get prepared and as they used to say in the navy batten down the hatches because inclement weather is on the way the storms of life are on the way it's true you know sometimes storms in our lives are really our own doing like in other words we can make decisions and we make choices that create a storm, create havoc in our own lives. But the truth be told is that God allows things to happen in our lives for a purpose yeah. in order to get our attention and to move us to the direction that he would have us to do. You know, Satan always, want, look, go to John chapter 10, verse 10, because the point that I was trying to make right there is that sometimes the storms in our own lives are our own doing and we often make decisions that cause us catastrophe <clears throat> but look even whenever we open up doors to things it creates a scenario it creates a storm it creates an, but it also creates an opportunity because in each and every conflict and each and every trial that you face in your life th there's there's always two versions of the story the enemy of your soul it's very important that you understand this because I don't care what you're facing it will always be the same the enemy of your soul, he has one plan for your life, and there it is right there. 
The thief cometh not but for to kill, to steal, and to destroy. But God has come that we might have life and that we might have it more abundantly. In each and every scenario that you find yourself, I can promise you that Satan wants to destroy you. He wants to steal from you. He wants to kill something. He wants to destroy something that you hold dear in your life. But that is not God's will. Amen. God's will is that ultimately the life that he offers through Jesus Christ, the life that he offers through the power of the Holy Spirit is that that is what would take place from the storm that he has allowed in our lives. God wants to allow the storm to steer us in the right direction. God was allowing the storm to take place in Jonah's life because Jonah was moving in the opposite direction, moving away from God, moving in a downward spiral, and God's wanting to get his attention and get him to move back towards the, the right place. So no, long, no matter how high the waves crash, hard the waves crash, no matter how loud the winds howl, you got to know that God is ultimately in control of the storm. Yes. Amen. You need to know that. Look, we find this truth in the life of Job. Because, see, the Lord told Satan exactly how far he could go in Job's life. Sometimes you will find yourself in the midst of a situation and a circumstance that you don't understand how in the world God could be in the middle of all that. How in the world could God really be? How could this be God's will? Whenever I see all of this trauma, all of this pain, all of this heartache, how could this be God's will? Well, I don't always understand why it is, but God allows certain things to happen for a bigger purpose. And in the life of Job, God told Satan exactly how far Job could go. See, if you're not careful, you will sit here and think that you can just tell God the way. Now, if you listen to some preachers today... The message that you will hear is that you can basically manipulate God's movement. You can basically manipulate God's hand by just telling God and confessing the right thing all of the time and, and, in order to move God's hand in the direction that you would have him to go. <clears throat> but I'm here to tell you that that's not what the word of God tells us in the book of Job. When we view the life of Job from the Bible, we get a glimpse into the spiritual realm. We get a, See, we can't necessarily see that in our own lives. But I believe with all of my heart that God allowed the life of Job and that whole situation to take place so that we could see what's going on in the spiritual realm and the life of the believer whenever he's under the attack of the enemy. The story goes that Satan asked permission to destroy Job. Satan asked God to remove a hedge of protection from around Job's life. And ultimately, God allowed that test to take place. God allowed that trial to take place in Job's life. But God also said, you can only go this far. You can't go that far. Amen. And so wherever you are in your life and whatever you face and whatever you face in your own life or with your own children, one of the things that you're going to have to remember that I'm going to have to remember is that no matter how bad it gets. God is ultimately the one that's in control. I believe that with all of my heart. I believe that many times we can miss it. We, in other words, we don't spend the time in prayer that we should. Like sister said last week, we don't take authority over the things that we've been given the power to take authority over. But even when all that's said and done, amen, God is the one that's ultimately the orchestrator of our life. He's ultimately the one that is in control of our lives. And when it's all said and done, God's purposes are to bring life, amen, in the midst of that negative circumstance. Look at Job chapter 42, verse 5 through 6. Because when it was all said and done and Job came to the end of nearing the end of this trial that he had faced, look what he says. He says, I have heard of thee by the hearing of the ear, but now my eye has seen thee. Wherefore, I abhor myself and repent in dust and ashes. The Bible started off the book of Job by talking to us that Job was a blameless man. It doesn't mean that he didn't ever sin because there was only one man that ever sinned and his name was Jesus. But what the Bible describes about Job is that he loved the Lord and that he was devoted to God, that he lived his life for God, that he worshiped God the way that they knew how to worship God to the point in the Old Testament that they understood. He did all of those things that God would have desired for him to do. But yet even with all of that said and all of the wisdom that Job had, whenever God shows up in the midst of all of these things that are taking place in his life, Job comes to the realization that I thought that I knew you. 
I thought that I knew you. I thought that I was close to you, but I realize now that I only knew you to the level of the hearing of the ear, but now my eyes have seen you. One of the things that you got to realize whenever the storm shows up in your life and God is trying to get you to head in the right direction is that when you go through these trials, when you go through the pain of life, God will bring you to a place, amen, where you will be able to see him more clearly. And listen, when you can see God more clearly, you also begin to see yourself more clearly. Job says, I saw you, but I also abhorred myself. Because, listen, even though Job was a man of God, there's no doubt in my mind and in my heart that there was a level to Job that had some level of self-righteousness. Because each and every believer, and, you, and, and it bears it out in the book if you study it enough, each and every believer, the, the closer we get to God, there's that level of pride and self-righteousness that tries to rise up on the inside of us, and we view our own lives compared to everyone else around us, and we see how we look compared to them, and many times we begin to believe a certain thing about ourselves that's not really the way that God would want it to see. And listen to me, when you get close to the presence of God, you, you don't automatically, you, you typically don't get puffed up and start to feel like you've arrived. That's not what the Bible continuously shows me. Because not only is it in Job's life, whenever he sees God and he abhors himself or <clears throat> he comes to the realization of what manner of a man he is, the Bible tells us on more than one occasion that that's the case. It says it in the book of Isaiah, when in the year that King Uzziah died, I saw the Lord seated on the throne. And the train of his veil filled the temple with glory and that the seraphim began to cry, holy, holy, holy. And the doorposts of the temple began to shake. And Isaiah said, woe unto me, for I'm a man of unclean lips and I live amongst the people of unclean lips. When you get close to the presence of God, you don't start thinking more highly of yourself because you see how holy God is. And you begin to realize how unworthy you are. And what it's supposed to do is drive you to the place where you would desire for God to move Amen. And for his will to be done in the midst of your life. So that's one of the things that the storms will do when you're headed in the wrong direction. God will allow the storm to begin to draw you back to a place where you can get closer to his presence and you can be able to see him more clearly. You know, when the storm going still talking about Job, when the storm was worse than Job's life, look at Job chapter 38, verse one. God spoke to him right in the middle of it. In Job chapter 38, verse 1, it says it. It says, Then the Lord answered Job out of the whirlwind and said. <laughs> Isn't it a good thing? If you've ever been in a storm, it's a good thing when God shows up and speaks in the midst of the whirlwind. And you don't necessarily always know exactly how that path's going to take. Sometimes we're so... Sometimes we're so blinded and so caught up in the middle of the storm. Have you ever, you ever been in a storm? Because I used to be kind of crazy like that when I was a teenager. The hurricane would come instead of going inside. I was like trying to go outside to play in it. But, you know, whenever you're in the middle of a storm and all that noise is going on and you're, you're, all you can focus on is, is, the, is the storm, the result of the storm, you know, and many times you don't even know how you ended up where you ended up. And I can remember, and I know I've shared it before, that, that, that the worst time of my life, I might have even mentioned it last week, when my sister Linda showed up one day. I was, I was, in, I was in a bar room. I'm telling you, my life was so bad at that point. I couldn't see anything. I didn't know, I don't know how in the world I was ever going to make it out. And all of a sudden I'm in there and there's my sister. And, and, and she said, you know, I want you to come live with me. That was just one move starting in the right direction. One, just one move. I didn't know where that move was going to take me, but God was showing up and allowing certain things to take place along the way. Amen. To get me to the place that he had for me to go. God will send the storms and sometimes it's hard to see him in it while they are raging, but never forget that there's an anchor that holds. You know, I use this scripture a lot. Probably some people maybe think I use it too much, but in Hebrews chapter six, verse 19, I want you to remember that no matter how bad it gets in your life, that God is there. Amen. God's there the whole time and he's holding on to you and there's a hope. 
Because what this is talking about, it says it right here, which hope we have as an anchor of the soul, both sure and steadfast, which enters into that within the veil. God, what it's talking about is Jesus as our high priest. It's talking about that fact that Jesus, after he offered himself as a sacrifice once for sin, and that the blood of Jesus, which was the fulfillment of the sacrificial system, was applied to the Holy of Holies in heaven, amen, that, and the veil was ripped from top to bottom, that now Jesus is seated at the right hand of the Father, and he ever lives to make intercession for us, but he's the anchor that's within the veil, within the Holy of Holies, in the very presence of God, and that no matter how bad the storm rages on the the outside there's an anchor that's where the old song came from based on this scripture there's an anchor that holds in spite of the storm yeah. So no matter how bad the storm gets, I just got to tell you that Jesus, hallelujah, has entered into the presence of the Lord. And Jesus is there waiting for us to call upon his name. He's waiting for Jonah to call on his name. Jonah's in the midst of the storm. He's running from God. He's going in the opposite direction. He's fleeing the presence of God. He's walking in darkness. He's in a downward spiral. And God is waiting. He sends the storm for Jonah to call upon his name. But Jonah was asleep in the storm. That's point number three. Jonah was asleep in the storm. Look at Jonah chapter 1, verses 4 through 5. It says, But the Lord sent out a great wind into the sea, and there was a mighty tempest in the sea, so that the ship was like to be broken. Then the mariners were afraid and cried every man unto his God and cast forth the wares that were in the ship into the sea. You ever notice there's at least two places in the Bible where there's a bad storm and they're on a ship, and this is one of them. There's more than that. But this is one of them. There's one in Acts 2, and they just start chunking stuff over the side. Dude, you know it's bad whenever they start throwing the tackle that has to do with their little sails or their oars or whatever it is that's going to help get them to where they need to go. When they start chunking that stuff in the water to lighten the load so that the ship becomes more buoyant, Houston, we got a problem. It's getting really bad, and that's what they're doing. It's bad. But look at this. But Jonah was going down into the sides of the ship, and he, and he lay and was fast asleep. In the middle of the worst storm of Jonah's life, he's fallen asleep. He had fallen asleep in the storm. But look at this. Jesus' disciples fell asleep in the garden. The kingdom of God is like this. While the servants slept, an enemy came and sowed tares amongst the wheat. Jonah's not the first one to fall asleep on, the, on his hitch, and he's certainly not the last. Amen. Look at 1 Thessalonians chapter 5, verses 3 through 7. You know, there's a, there's a danger <clears throat> that the child of God, who loves God, <clears throat> would fall asleep in the midst of the storm. The Apostle Paul says, For when they shall say peace and safety, then sudden destruction comes upon them as travail upon a woman with child, and they shall not escape. Escape, But ye, brethren, are not in darkness, that that day should overtake you as a thief. You are all the children of light and the children of the day. We are not of the night nor of darkness. Therefore, let us not sleep as do others, but let us watch and be sober. For they that sleep in the night and they that be drunken are drunken in the night. The Apostle Paul is talking to the church of Thessalonica right here, and he's talking to them about the rapture of the church. He's talking to them about the end of this age. And he's telling them, don't fall asleep. Don't fall asleep spiritually. You're, you're a believer. You've been told the word of God. The rapture hasn't already taken, and, and you should not fall asleep in the midst of darkness. No, the world is doing that. Unfortunately, many times the world creeps into the church and the church connects itself so close to the world that it falls asleep also. The Apostle Paul warns us that we're to be sober in the last days. That in the last days that there's going to be all kind of wickedness, all kind of deception that goes on around us and it will lull the believer to sleep. If we begin to partake of what the world is doing and we begin to allow the world to influence us, then there's a good chance that we will become very sleepy even though we're in the midst of a storm and like Jonah end up sleeping in the midst of it all. When God's trying to speak, when God's trying to show. Listen, there's a storm going on in the world today. But like frogs in a pot of water that just, you know, like, I mean, that's what they do, right? I mean, they're cold-blooded, they're cold-blooded animals. And what ends up happening is, is that they just adjust. And that's the way that, this, that Satan has been working in the society that we live in. Slowly but surely, 
putting the pollution and the poison in the mix of society to the point where we're just accepting it. What would have, been, what would have appalled us 20 years ago now if we just take it as normal circumstance? Oh, it is what it is. It's just the way that it is. It's going on that way. And now our children beneath us that have grown up, even though we've tried to explain the, the society that they've lived in. I'm not trying to pick on my kids or anybody else's kids. I'm just trying to tell you that the society that they have been raised in, it, it's starting to lull us to sleep. Amen. We've, been, we've been inundated by this message of the world for so long, it's starting to change the way we think. Not that we agree with them, but we've become numb to it. We become sleepy to it. If it's done that to us, how do we think it's affecting our own children? Lord, help us. We don't want to fall asleep whenever times are bad. When we move away from the presence of God's will, we move towards darkness and we fall into a spiritual sleep and a spiritual drunkenness. That was point number three. This is point number four. But affliction has a way. I got a lot of points this morning. <laughs> affliction has a way of getting our attention. Man, John is full of some stuff, man. I could have preached three messages on this, but I figured I'd spare y'all. Easy. I think I preached on Jonah for six months one time. <laughs> affliction has a way of getting our attention. Look at Jonah chapter 2, verse 2. This is a short one. Short point. Jonah said... I cried by reason of my affliction unto the Lord, and he heard me out of the belly of hell, cried I, and thou heard my voice. It, you see what he says? I cried by reason of my affliction. But Ted Turner can say whatever he wants. But look, when affliction touches the child of God, whenever negative circumstances, whenever the storms of life get bad enough, guess what? It'll start to rub you the wrong way. The word affliction means adversity, anguish, distress, tribulation, trouble. When enough trouble and distress and tribulation starts to touch the child of God, it will begin to wake you up. Amen. Yeah, yes, it will. I mean, you learn how to fall asleep on a boat, even in the midst of some waves. But when the waves get bad enough, it will wake you up when you start rolling into the wall. Believe me, I've been on some work vessels before. God may have to poke awfully hard, but sooner or later when he starts poking, it will wake you up. Jonah said, in the midst of my affliction, I cried out to you. Hallelujah. And he heard me. God knows, man. You I, I was, I've talked to, I've had conversations with people before, you know, to talk about how sometimes in our lives it almost feels like God's playing chess with us. You, you know, it, like you, you make a move and the next thing you know, God makes a move. <laughs> and then you think you got something going on and it's like all of a sudden now he's made a move and you, there's nowhere else for you to go. It's like, oh my gosh, what is this right here? You, the point that I'm trying to make is, is that God's, God's up there in the heavens and he's like, just, I think he makes a face like this. I mean, he probably doesn't, but <laughs> really? <laughs> like, I created you. I'm the creator of heaven and earth and all that in them is. And you said you believe that. And yet here you are over here trying to manipulate your circumstances in your life, acting like I don't see everything that you're doing. How silly are you, little boy? <laughs> what is going on? Oh, I'm sleepy, God. Just let me roll over and go back to night night. And, and, but yet whenever the affliction gets bad enough, when the anguish gets bad enough and he pokes you hard enough, it'll wake you up. Amen. And in the middle of my anguish, in the middle of my affliction and my adversity, I cried unto the Lord and he heard me. And the reason that I gave that whole scenario of the chest move is because God knows. He knows when we, he knows when we play in mind games. Amen. And you might be able to get away with that. But I've, I've prided myself on the fact that I'm so, I, I mean, I, it, it, it's wrong to be prideful for the wrong way. But I, I imagine in my own mind that I'm just so perceptive about things. But, you know, there's been times that I've realized as perceptive as I thought I was, I had fallen asleep and there were things going on right under my nose that I didn't even know was happening. Mm -hmm. So as perceptive as I think I am, wrong. You, you, people get away. You might be able to fool me. And it's not always that easy to do. But you might be able to fool me. But you ain't fooling God. Mm -hmm. <laughs> I'm not going to fool God. 
and, 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 and the whole time when, when all of that is happening, though, he also knows when you're not trying to fool him anymore. That's really what I was trying to what I was trying. And whenever he realizes that we've gotten to the place that we're really not trying to fool him anymore. When my affliction hit me and I cried out unto the Lord, you heard me. That's a good place to be. And even though the storm got real bad, it finally poked me enough to wake me up. And in that despair and in that affliction, I cried out unto the Lord and he heard me. Look what it says in Psalm 34, 19. Many are the afflictions of the righteous, but the Lord delivers him out of them all. That word delivers right there, it means to be torn away. It describes a violent deliverance. The enemy is violent. The enemy wants to try to trap us. The enemy wants to try to destroy us. But when God sees his people, when he sees his children come to the place of affliction, where their heart truly cries out, where they really desire to be delivered, God is quick and swift to move yes. and to deliver his Amen. people. Amen. Like the storm, so is affliction. God has a way of shaking things up in our lives and causing us to become desperate for him to move for us. This brings me to point number five. It's my last point, but there's a couple points under five. <laughs> but the main thought of point number five is this, that our will must submit to his will and then restoration can begin. Amen. Amen. So under point number five, I guess I got sub point A, which it talks about our will. And there's a couple of little points under that too, but they're all moving quick. All right. I, a is our will. And point number one under that is has to be brought low. Our will has to be brought low. John the Baptist said that I must decrease so that he can increase. Look at Jonah chapter two, verse six. So not only did he go down to Joppa, down into the ship, down into the sides of the ship, but then once, once he's thrown into the water and he remembers this prayer, the Bible says that I went down to the bottoms of the mountains. The earth with her bars was about me forever. Yet hast thou brought up my life from corruption, O Lord my God. How long? How low will we go before our will gives in to God? That's really the question. I mean, because we're talking about our will versus God's will right now. That's, that's A under point number five is our will. And it's really versus God's will. How low will we have to go before we ultimately give in to God? That's a big question that we need to ask ourselves. And we should really always remember it as long as we live upon this earth that our will stands in between us and God's will. We can do all the hiding and running and singing low we want, but we will never really get away from him. Psalm 139 verse 7 says, where shall I go from your spirit or where shall I flee from your presence? You're not going to get away from the presence of the Lord. Jonah is no different. He's already gone down to Joppa. He went down into the ship, the sides of the ship, but he still had to go down further yet in order to get low enough where God could get his attention. That was point. That was one, one thing having to do with our will. But look, this is another thing having to do with our will. Well, I thought this was really good right here. Point number two under that, our will, the enemy will always provide a counterfeit for your will to cling to. The enemy will always provide a counterfeit for your will to to cling to mm -hmm. something other than the presence of God, something other than God's will, something other than the direction that God would have you to go. Oh, and it takes many a form. It takes all kinds of, uh, of, of forms. Sometimes it can be a wrong kind of relationship. Sometimes it can be drugs. Sometimes it can be alcohol. Sometimes it can be music, anything that can provide an escape. Sometimes it can be television. Sometimes it can be like, what are you trying to preach against everything? Preach. I'm trying to preach against anything that stands between you and God. I'm trying to preach about anything that prevents you or I from surrendering to the ultimate will of God to be able to hear the voice of God because if we're going in the opposite direction of God then we're not hearing his voices clearly amen and we're entering into darkness and we're on that downward slide and, and the enemy is always going to be throwing he's going to throw you a bunch of life preservers he's going to throw you all try that try that that'll numb it here you go here's another one Look at this, what he says right here. Jonah chapter 2, verse 8. In the King James Version, this is what it says. Jonah chapter 2, verse 8. This is good enough to wait for. It says, they that observe lying vanities forsake their own mercy. I want to break that down for you. I want to give it to you in another translation. This is how, it, this is how it, it's worded in, an, in another translation. Those 
who cling to worthless idols forfeit the grace that could be theirs. Amen. Those that cling to worthless idols forfeit the grace that could be theirs. Whenever the devil's out there throwing all those life preservers and we're over there snatching and grabbing and grabbing a hold of anything that we can get our hands on, we're, while we're holding on to that thing that the enemy's giving us as a counterfeit, we can't grab on to the one thing that God really wants to give us, which is the grace that we need for that circumstance, that situation, that storm that we're facing, the very willingness to surrender to the will of God. There will always be something else that we can look to or cling to that will get in the way of what God is wanting to do in our lives. And the longer we resist and hold on to those things, the longer that we are separated from God's will for our lives. <coughs> now, part B of the will is God's will. It's, it was your will first, and those were the things under your will. Now it's God's will. It's not what God would prefer. You know, God would prefer that he wouldn't have to send the storm to begin with. I mean, can we all agree on that? God would prefer that he never had to send the storm, that he never had to send the affliction, that he never had to allow all of these things to happen in our lives. But instead, he would prefer that we would hear the word of God and by the spirit of God would willingly submit. But this beautiful gift that he's given us in our own free will, it also works against us. Because there's just parts of us, if we're honest with one another, that doesn't want to give in. Amen. There's parts of us that doesn't want to surrender. Mm -hmm. And the minute that we sit here and we think, well, I'm not like that. I want to surrender. You're lying. You're full of religion. You're full of self-righteous religion. Because there's areas in each and every one of our lives that doesn't want to surrender to the ultimate will of God. Amen. Your, your lack of surrender may not look like my lack of surrender, but it's lack of surrender all the same. Yes. Amen. So God desires, he would prefer that he wouldn't have to send the storm. I used this scripture recently. It's one of my favorite scriptures. I'll probably use it in every message now, now that I refound it again. <laughs> Psalm chapter 32, verses 8 through 9. Because, I mean, all these things that are going on in Jonah's life, God's desiring to get him back to the right place, the right direction. But he's being like a mule, <laughs> stubborn, hard-headed. Look what God says. I will instruct you and teach you in the way that you should go. Amen. Yes. God says, I got a good plan for you. Oh, yeah. I got a good word for you. I got some good direction for your life. Yes. I want to instruct you in the way you should go. He says, I will guide you in my eye. Wow, what an awesome deal. Think about that. I will guide. Because I don't know about you, but. Well, I know I've used, I've even used this bad when you keep using the same illustrations, man. There's a street. I don't even know what the name of that street is. It's a weird place. It's right there in front of that pizza hut, that new pizza hut that they made in Morgan City. You know what I'm talking about? That delivery place. It's right there on that little weird street that kind of, I don't know if y'all know what I'm talking about. Brashier. It's, well, it's off of Brashier. It, it'll cut you back. It, it kind of like goes between. A little short boulevard? Yes, that little short boulevard. <laughs> Right there, if you're coming from like to, from back towards where where Victor Two is, towards where you can take a left to get on the main Brashier, you know what I'm talking about. There's this horrible pothole, and and this and I think I've just lost the whole point that I was trying to say. But I, but I do know this that that pothole is so bad that every time my tire falls into that pothole, it jerks me and it jolts me, and I think I pretty get kind of angry. For at least a moment in time. And, you know, I was just thinking, I don't know if y'all saw that Domino's Pizza now is willing to fix people's streets if it's on the, I wonder if they'd fix the street right there from the pizza. Yeah, yeah. That pothole is so bad. But you know what it is? It's like a jolt. It reminds me, it wakes me up. Oh my gosh, there's that pothole right there. The next time maybe I'll remember whenever I drive over here. And that's kind of like what this, it's like a stubborn mule that refuses to be awakened and refuses to go in the right direction instead has to have a bit and a bridle in its mouth to be pulled in the right to be jolted off of the course that it's been going that's that's kind of like what I say and so that's what's going on in the life of, of Jonah where the storm is being used by God the affliction being used by God to jolt him off of the pathway that he's going on to wake him up so that he can be brought on the right pathway. God says, I will guide you. That was one of the things that I was really trying to say right there. I keep forgetting that that pothole is there. 
God knows what lies ahead on the path is what I'm trying to say. Yes. He knows. I don't know. I don't know what comes tomorrow. Amen. Amen? Amen. But he knows and he's willing to make a deal with me. He says, I will instruct you and I will guide you with my eye. Be not as the horse or as the mule, which have no understanding, whose mouth must be held in with bit and bridle lest they come near unto me. Don't be like that. I want to lead you. I want to guide you. My eye sees ahead. I have foreknowledge. I have insight that you don't have. I want to lead you down the right path. But, but don't, be, don't be stubborn like a mule and refuse to come this way unless I have to jerk you off the path. Unless I have to send the storm. Unless I have to send the affliction to wake you up from where you are. This is, this is actually point number one under God's will. When, when our will quits, God's will shows up. Look at John, Jonah chapter 2 verse 7. We're getting near the end. When my soul fainted within me, I remembered the Lord and my prayer came in unto thee into your holy temple. Fainted. It means to be overwhelmed. When my will finally becomes overwhelmed and I give in to God's will. You know, Paul talked about this in 2 Corinthians 12, 9. When he asked the Lord to remove that thing from him, remember that? God's response was this. My grace is sufficient for you, for in weakness, my strength is made perfect. Amen. One of the things that we have to understand is, is this. Well, first off, Ted Turner was really wrong. Amen. Because there's a level to strength that man does not know whenever his weakness moves out. Whenever mankind recognizes his own weakness and recognizes the fact that independent of God, he will not get it done and that he is completely dependent upon God. There's a new level of strength that shows up. Amen. And God, hallelujah, when his strength goes to work, it's what we need. Amen. Mm -hmm. Point number two under, under God's will is that he wants our will to want his will. Amen. God wants our will to want his will. Look at Jonah chapter two, verse four. Jonah says, then I said, I am cast out of your sight, yet I will look again toward thy holy temple. Now, I've read this and studied this book many a times, and I've come to the conclusion that it seems like Jonah would have written this prayer, this song. If you go back and you read chapter two, it's like it's a prayer. It's like a prayer that's a song that Jonah wrote after this occurrence. And it seems certainly that he would have written this later on as he was reflecting, because it seems like much of what he's writing is actually taking place while he was in the belly of the fish. So he's certainly not in there with a candle, you know, like the little cartoon has of the guy inside the well's belly. But instead, this is afterwards when he's reflecting on the various things that had taken place in his life. And he begins to he begins to write this. But he says, I am cast out of your sight, yet will I look again towards your holy temple. But I think about it, you know, from a physical perspective, just bear with me. I think about Jonah being inside this the, 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 the belly of this fish. And to be honest with you, there has been reported in instances where men, if you do enough research, where men have been swallowed whole by large fish and actually were it survived and had been left in there for hours at a time and actually survived. It didn't turn out exactly the way that the story in Jonah did, but there's documented <laughs> evidence that these things have happened. Okay. So, but what I want you to know is that I'm trying to like, give you an illustration physically, but there's really a spiritual application. So Jonah's inside the belly of this fish. And I don't feel like it's like in the cartoon where there's this big old area. I think he's actually cramped up in this thing and he can't really move. And he says, I'm, I'm out of your sight. I'm far away from you. My decisions have brought me in another direction. Yet will I turn again towards your holy temple. All right. So I see him trying to move up in this fish because you see when Daniel prayed from Babylon, he turned towards Jerusalem. So that's what that's what the idea in the Old Testament for the Old Testament saint was, was that he would find the direction of Jerusalem. He would turn towards Jerusalem and he would pray towards Jerusalem. The reason why was because that's where the temple was. That's where the Holy of Holies was. And beyond the veil was the Ark of the Covenant with the mercy seat, the cherubim, where God's presence promised to be with his people. So what they would do is they were turning towards the presence of God to, to, to seek 
his face again. So I imagine Jonah up in here, and he's all discombobulated. He has no sense of direction. He was on the boat one minute, he was in the water the next, and he's swallowed by a fish. God knows which direction the fish is going. And here's Jonah trying to turn around in the belly of the fish to face towards Jerusalem. I don't know if all that's really what was going on. I really think more spiritually what he was saying is, I have found myself so far away from your presence, and I don't know which direction I'm going, yet even in all of that, I will turn again towards your holy temple. I will turn again towards your spirit. Amen. I need you to move and operate in my life. In other words, God's saying, Jonah's finally saying, I want my will to line up with your will, God. I want my will to line up with your will. God gave us a free will as a gift. I know I say that a lot, but he wants us to willingly give that will back to him. Amen. Amen. I'll tell you this, that as much of a fight as the child of God will put up in his flesh to run away from the will and presence of God, once he allows God to bend his will towards the right direction, there is no devil in hell that will be able to prevent him from turning back towards God. And at that moment, his spirit knows exactly which direction to turn. Isn't that good? I, you know, just think about that. I'm talking about from a spiritual perspective. I see Jonah rolling around in that fish's belly. Oh, is Jerusalem to my left? Is Jerusalem to my right? Which way do I go? But you know what? In the spiritual realm, whenever we come to the end of ourselves, when we come to the end of our own will, we know where to turn. Right. The Spirit of God yeah. speaks. Yeah. He's right there to tell yeah. us exactly yeah. what's the next step and where to go.